So starting on page two of the sampling overview, uh, we should finish this up to, uh, today. And we may even do some multiple choice questions on uh, stratification of a sample. Remembering that we do, we, we make the audit report based on material misstatements. We're looking for things that are material. Uh, that would lead you to recognize that not everything is equal as far as you know, the, um, the size of it. And then for instance, in our sample, uh, you know, here we have a cost receivable sample. There's, there's 5,000 items in here, but we picked the first 10. And which one of those, uh, which one of those 10 items, which ones would be the most important ones? Which ones would be the ones that you'd probably want to take a look at? Maybe large number, like um, five mm -hmm. and the two and the six. Yeah, five. Yeah, good. The, the large ones, five, two, six. Yeah, yeah, these are much bigger, obviously, than a lot of the other ones. So these are in the tens of thousands. And if you look at something like number three, even if that was misstated 100%, I mean, there's some control issues there, but for the most part, if, if even if that one was completely, it probably wouldn't make any difference. So there, there is the idea that the size of them does matter, that the, the larger they are, um, you know, the, the, the more likely that you'd want to test those. All right. Here's a question. Which account is most likely fraud? The 25,000, the round number. Yeah. A little yeah. too perfect. Although it could be a sale that was just priced that way. Could be, but you shouldn't want to look into it. Uh, one of the weird things about frauds is that people a lot of times use nice big round numbers. It's an odd thing, but uh, you know, a lot of that, that's all. And when you look at things like accounts receivable, you know, we have, you know, possibly multiple invoices and that sort of thing. To have something come out to exactly 25,000, it's kind of rare. Um, not only that, a lot of times you'd have things that are, uh, for instance, it probably doesn't involve this case, but uh, things like bribes and things like that are a lot of times in round numbers. You know? <laughs> How much is a bribe? $5,000, $10,000, or whatever it is. So a lot of times you do find criminal activity that happens in nice round numbers, more likely than someone ordering parts out of a catalog or something like that. So yeah, six would probably be the one you'd, you'd certainly be interested in that one and why it's a nice, perfectly round number. It might be, again, might be completely legitimate, but don't look at it. Okay, so one thing they might do is stratify the sample. And you do it this way, you say something like, okay, everything over $10,000, um, we'll look at that 100%. And Maybe we'll be down to nine, nine. Oops. You're going to go, uh, I don't know, thirty percent of those. Anything under a thousand, maybe you say, okay, we'll do 5% of those. 
So let me do a stratify the sample. And that is done to look at those things that are more important uh, to give those more consideration. This actually is not a sample. This is a taking 100%. Uh, these two are sampling. So you'll do random numbers or whatever, whatever it is to pick the sample. All these considered together would be considered a sample. This first one, you're taking 100% of them, you're taking all of them. You know, that's the, the entire population that's over. Actually, this should say 10,000, shouldn't it? That says over 10,000. If it was right at 10,000, it would be down here. Okay, there's a flash on the screen. Not sure what it was. Okay, so, um, so anyway, this is stratification of the sample. And again, the stratification of the sample is so that those things that are more important are more likely to be material you're going to look at uh, those a little bit more closely than those things that aren't. So if it's over 10,000, you want to look at all of them. 1,000 to 10,000, 30%. Uh, and notice too, though, that every item has a possibility of being picked. If this, if this is random, you know, if you do these for uh, is a random. Everything has a possibility of being picked. Now, it's less of a possibility down here, but still everything in there has a possibility of being picked. And so that helps our, our, for our random sample because that a random sample is more likely to um, To represent the population as a whole and be free from bias. Okay, so one of the important things is that every item in there can be picked. And by the way, that's one of the reasons why it's, you know some of these other ones are not very good ones to pick. Block sample, not every item can be picked. Haphazard can be systematic. They're going to skip some items. They have no chance of being picked. So we're looking for random. Okay, attribute sampling. Uh, these are yes, no questions. So attribute sampling, you're looking for an attribute. So, was the purchase order signed by uh, an operating manager? Yes or no, it either was signed by an operating manager or it wasn't. And attribute sampling is usually used for testing controls. So attribute sampling, testing controls, uh, you know, is this where so oops. Oops. <laughs> so purchase order must be signed by an operating manager. And so you're looking to see if it's signed. It's either signed by an operating manager or it isn't. So it's a yes or no test. Uh, this is a binomial kind of test, um, either yes or no. And one thing you know about binomial, uh, 
tells me that it's no fun. <laughs> you can think about a lot of, uh, of uh, calculation to do binomial testing. However, we take advantage of uh, the central limit theorem in, in uh, sampling. You guys have statistics classes, right? The uh, central limit theorem. You guys go over there. Uh, central limit theorem is. It basically says that so this is what the uh, central limit theorem is. It's actually kind of interesting. It's, um, the central limit theorem is that I can say all that most distributions will match the normal distribution Over repeated attempts. So, no matter what your distribution looks like, your distribution might look like this, or it might look like this, or whatever. But if you do that enough times, it's going to look like a normal distribution. And for us, uh, binomial is kind of like a coin flip. So if you flip a coin, you have two possible outcomes. You can have a head or a tail, right? So, you know, head or tail, you have the equal amounts, 50-50. You have two coin flips, what could happen? Okay, well, you could have a head, head. You could have a head and a tail. You could have a tail and a head. Or you could have a tail and a tail. Right, those are the possibilities. Okay, so uh, here is where it gets a little bit, uh, you know, if you don't care about the order, and for sampling we don't for our pro we're doing, we don't care about when we find the uh, uh, problem. Yeah, the uh, chances that would be a head and a head are, oops, 25%. If you had one tail and one head, notice that both of those, you know, if you don't if you don't care about the order, you know, it could be head or tail, and you don't care about which order it comes in. Well, then both of those would fit. So even after just two coin flips, you know, it'll look like. It starts to look like a normal distribution. So the nice thing about this is that we can use the normal distribution
to estimate binomial to Maybe a little bit different now, but uh, computers for a long time weren't accurate enough too that they would start doing rounding to get really high numbers. And um, it used to be that the estimate would often come up more accurately than the actual numbers because they do rounding to get to the really big numbers. But anyway, so we use very much what would look like classical sampling to do the estimate of um, attribute samples. Okay, so attribute sampling. And so this is doing tested controls. And uh, do you guys remember? I think we talked about test controls. Are they required? Are you required to do test the controls? It's actually kind of a loaded question, but um, are you required to do test the controls? AICPA. Not required unless Uh, AFC, not required unless the controls will be relied upon. So if you're gonna rely on the internal controls, you have to test them. If you're not gonna rely on them, you don't have to. So for instance, you have a, a client that only has uh, you know, five contracts. You don't really care about the contract. You, know, you have to look at all five contracts anyway. So don't worry about the controls, just look at the contracts and see if they're uh, you know, not materially misstated. PCOB required. Does not a report is given on internal controls. So test the controls, AICPA is not required unless you're gonna rely on them. PCOB, it is required because there's no audit report is required. Um, on internal controls. So you have two audit reports for PCOB and one's on internal controls because of that. Oh, it got cut off. See, I wasn't wrong. Okay, I was a little wrong. All right, so that is um, kind of the attribute sampling. Attribute sampling actually is hit usually harder than the the. Um, um, I'm going blank. <laughs> it's down the page. No, it's not. Uh, attribute sampling is. Uh, uh, ah. I believe I'm drawing a blank on this. Here, let's look at my face while I, while I puzzle and pause. What is it? The attribute sampling and substantive. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I taught auditing 
50 times, so I uh, think I'd know it by now. Okay, so this is attribute sampling. <clears throat> looking for attributes. Discovery sampling is when you're looking for something, usually looking for, say, fraud or something along those lines. And this is done when you, you want to get some kind of a feel for um, how likely is it that whatever this whatever this thing is you're looking for, how likely is it that it, it, it's there in the books? Again, a lot of times it's fraud. Though if they think that there's fraud happening in a certain division or something like that, they'll look through um, a number of items and then and they'll get some kind of a uh, a feel for it. A lot of times. What they'll be doing is looking for usually not an exception rate. You, you can do it with an exception rate, but uh, a lot of times what they're really looking for is um, that if you take a certain number of items, how sure are you, and, and nothing is found, how sure are you that the rest of it is? So I'm, I'm just making these numbers up, but the idea is exactly the same. Um, to take 150 items, you might be 5% uh, sure. So you take 150 items, there are, there's nothing wrong with any of them. You might be 5% confident that there's nothing wrong with the entire population. If you take uh, 280 items and nothing's wrong, maybe you're 1% uh, sure. So there's nothing wrong with it. So the larger, you know, the further you go without finding an event, the more uh, confident you are that they are that you won't, that there isn't a problem with it. So at some point you're gonna probably gonna say, okay, you know, you get this tip that maybe there was fraud in some division, and you start going through the sampling, and, and, and at some point you're probably gonna say, okay. You know, we're at the 99.9% .9 level. There is no fraud here. You know, I, I've actually had people that have come up to me when I was doing auditing and say, oh, there's fraud here. I'll show you. Know, and <laughs> they give you something completely stupid. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so anyway, uh, discovery samples, we were trying to look, looking for something. Classical sampling, we did. Uh, uh, probably proportional size. This this is a called different things. This can be called monetary unit. Oh, yeah, you know, there's actually, let me, let me do something a little different. Probably proportional size, something's called PPS. The same thing as monetary unit sampling. Same thing as, Ooh. 
they're all the same thing. And this is a sampling type that we're probably going to start. Well, we'll see how it comes out tonight, but probably next week. Um, we may, may uh, do that. Well, private portion size is kind of interesting in that uh, it, it's, it's only for auditors. And it's not, uh, it, it has some advantages in certain situations and uh, some disadvantages in certain situations. Uh, dual purpose test. I think we already talked about dual purpose test, didn't we? I'm virtually positive we did. It's sort of like if you have a test of controls. Attribute sampling. You know, maybe you need a hundred items. No, let's make it 120 items. Need 500 items. You can actually use the 120 items in both of the tests. So this would be a dual purpose. So in other words, you only need uh, what 380 new items. Okay. For some odd reason, the dual purpose test. Uh, at least a lot of those CPA review classes kind of gets hit hard. I'm not sure it uh, is that um, heavily test on the exam, or maybe there's just a bunch of old, old questions that relate to it. But for some reason, you know, if you take a CPA review, you'll, you'll, you'll run across um, five, five questions on dual purpose tests. It's kind of just common sense. I mean, and it's more for efficiency than actually, um, you know, you know, effectiveness. So. Okay. And this is a basic sampling stuff. Um. I'm sure you guys have this, you know, in any of your sampling classes have something like this. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, suppose sample indicated account table had a projected value of 100,000. And, you know, the normal distribution is here that the further out you go, you're more likely to be in that area. So for instance, uh, this goes down to what, 85,000 and up to 115,000. And that would say that you're 99.7% sure that it's between those two, between 85,000 and some 85,000. to 115,000, that you'd be 97% sure of that. 
you're 90, 94% sure of. No, that's not right. Yeah, You're ninety five percent sure that's between ninety thousand and one hundred ten thousand, so and so forth. So, the further out you are from it, the more likely that it's going to be you know, it's in there. So, this is kind of like the spread on that bell curve. So, sampling risk is. Sampling risk is the risk that it, uh, you know, what's the risk that you're going to be wrong? So sampling risk is that risk that you're going to be wrong. And you know, I'm going to talk about something else here. Okay, so So, for instance, if you have this situation, the book value is one hundred five thousand, and the audit value is one hundred two thousand. So, you take your you, know, you do your test and you end up with this. And you say, okay, well, it's in, you know, it's in the range that we thought it might be. And you know, this is it might go down to this, which is say, I don't know, like 97,000. So we say, okay, this could go down to 97,000. Okay, well, you know, we're okay with that. You know, maybe our tower of misstatement is 15,000. This is within 15,000, whatever it is, 13,000. So we're okay with that. But now remember, this is a sample. And the actual amounts, it's possible, could be on the outside here. This is the sampling risk. So sampling risk is that the sample does not match the entire the population as a whole. What's the word above value at the top? Up here? Yeah. Book. <laughs> so if the book value say is 105,000 and you do your test and you say, okay, we're 95% sure whatever they could go as low as 97,000, but we're allowing for say 15,000 of materiality. So this is within that 15,000. This is only eight thousand or whatever it is. So, you know, and one of the things you know, you'll you depending on what the what what the item is, you know, 
you just possibly have a two you know, type of test here. Um, for instance, something like accounts receivable. You're generally not, you know, accounts receivable, you're generally not going to get sued if their accounts receivable are better than you uh, estimated. But if they're worse, you're, you're going to have a problem. So it depends on what the item is. If this was accounts payable, it'd be just the opposite. But the sampling risk is that the, um, is the risk Can't be there. Uh, sampling risk is a risk that the sample does not represent the population as a whole. So your sample, you know, it's possible it could be over here or over here. The actual, yeah, you know, it, it might be remote, but it is possible. So sampling risk is a risk that your sample does not represent the population as a whole. And there's nothing you can do about that. Uh, the auditor cannot eliminate this in sampling. So you cannot, and, and now the only way to eliminate it is to take 100% of the item, which is not really sampling, it's just taking every single item. So if you have a sample, you can do it at the 99% level, you know, there's still a 1% chance that you're wrong, that, the, the, that there's a sampling. So sampling risk is one of those things that you cannot get out of. And one of the things you should always recognize too that, you know, if, if you if you go to the say 95% level, that means that one out of 20 times that you do a sample, it's gonna be wrong. And there's nothing you can do about that. So when you take a sample of something and it comes up indicating something that there's something's a problem, a lot of times you take another sample because one out of 20 times it's going to be your sample is going to be wrong if you're at the 95% level. Take another sample, you know, maybe it's you're, you're okay. But um, so initially, when you first run your sample, if you come up with a problem, especially, you don't start jumping up and down and accusing them of fraud. You probably take another sample because of this. You know, they might be enough um, in that sampling risk. Now, one thing they also hit on is non-sampling risk. Okay, not a sampling risk. Um, a lot of times, this is these are errors by the auditor. So you test the wrong thing. You think you're testing the invoices when you're actually uh, testing a purchase order or whatever. Um, that's not sampling risk. You know, sampling risk is just saying that the sample, something's wrong with the, you know, that the sample does not represent the population as a whole. That's the only thing that is sampling risk. Basically, every other risk is non-sampling risk. So if the auditor audits the wrong thing, if they apply the, the sample wrong, um, that's not a sampling error or sampling risk. 
that's non-sampling risk. That's, that's risk due to error. You know, the only thing that's sampling risk is this. Everything else is not. So, you know, uh, here's the auditor. Or it could be, uh, you know, whatever, whatever it is. Anything else that, that's a risk is not sampling risk. So, sampling risk is simply that the the sample itself does not represent the population as a whole. And again, a certain percent of the time, it's going to, that, that's going to be the case. Okay. Uh, let's go back to. So for instance, here, the sampling risk is this, is 4.6%. Um, that's only for the sample. It's not for people making errors, people uh, auditing the wrong thing, uh, someone auditing the same accounts receivable twice, uh, you know, all that kind of other stuff that can be to play. Okay. Test the controls, and again, I told you, I think that these are actually tested quite a bit. Um, well, there's a lot of, there's a lot of questions. I'll put it this way. There's a lot more questions that test and control than substantive testing. Okay, so. Uh, for example, a client may have a control that requires Two manager signatures on checks written for more than $5,000. Okay, this is a yes, no test. They either have the signature or they do not have, oops, either have the signature or they do not have the signature. So flipping a coin, heads or tails. Uh, the other chose a sample of 200 checks written for more than 5,000. The auditor allows for an error rate of 7%. This is level of control risk. Uh, for the, uh, the allowance for sampling risk is 2%. And the results are as follows. Okay, what is the error in the sample? What's the error rate in the sample? Anyone? You don't want to if you don't want to say it out loud, you can put it in the chat if you want. So they took it, they took 200 checks. 194 of them were okay. Six of them were not. So what's the error rate? Three percent. Three percent. Yeah, three. Yeah, three. So it's um, it six errors, six uh, exceptions divided by two hundred in the sample. Oops. That's not even a letter. And that's too confusing. So the error rate is 0 0.03 or 3%. Now, it says our allowance for sampling risk is 2%. So this is actually plus or minus two. Now, generally speaking, we don't care about the minus two. So at 3%, it could be 
3% minus 2 would be 1%. We're not really worried about that one, but what we are worried about is the plus, and that is the 2%. You know, if, if the actual rate is, let me do this one. So the error rate is 3%. Sampling risk is 2%. Then the, what they call the upper limit. The uh, 5%. Okay, so underneath that bell curve, we're saying that uh, so we would allow for an error rate of seven percent. We did our test, came up with three uh, percent, and so that, along with the sampling risk of two percent, we mean that the whatever to whatever level we're testing to that. The 5% uh, would be the upper limit of the exception. The lower limit would be 1%, 3% minus 2, but we're not really worried about that direction. So this is the uh, upper limit. So would we accept that these controls are working or not? Yes. Oops. Yeah, it's less than those that are upper limit. So it is less than the 7% error rate that we would allow for. And so we would accept that the controls are working. Okay, now, this is tested quite a bit. And these are kind of the hardest questions for um, the C. I did that as a, you gotta be kidding me. I did it as a, <laughs> I did it as a, a, a picture instead of a, See, I used to teach all this stuff in, uh, you know, in class, you know, you know. Okay. So we test the internal controls. And if we come up with a judgment that they're adequate, <laughs> Try some other way. A little star. Okay, so if we come up with our controls and we say that they are adequate, and they are adequate. Everything's okay, 
right? If, if we say that the controls are adequate, and when in truth, they actually are adequate, we came up with the right decision. Okay, let's find a different one. Uh, how about a triangle? If we come up and say that they're inadequate, and they actually are inadequate, that's okay. <laughs> oh, okay, that's not good. That's okay too, right? If we say, okay, we can't rely on these controls. We can't think they're inadequate, and they truly are inadequate. Okay, so that is okay also. So it's don't rely on them. We came up with that decision not to rely on them based on our uh, sample. So we're, we're okay there too. The problem is when we don't match what the actual is. Oh, I can do this. Let's do it. Uh, let me try it. Let me try this again. Okay. So when we assess, and we say that uh, we think that the uh, the controls are inadequate, when actually they are adequate, we're saying the control risk is too high. So we assess the control risk as being worse than it really is. Now this isn't so much of a problem because this means that we're going to test more. We're going to test more than we should. And this one, you know, you just do more testing and eventually you'll come around to the right answer. This one. Is the problem. And here's why. We do the test, we think that the controls are working when actually they aren't. So maybe this is kind of like we're up here. We come up with 3%. Maybe 3% is way up. Maybe this should be 11%. So we think the controls are adequate, but they're not. This leads to an ineffective audit. Now, usually we will just do some more testing um, you know, if it was down over here, but here we think everything's okay when it's really not okay. So this is the problem with this one. Okay, sorry about that. Talking about paint. <laughs> okay, so this is the test control, and this is when you run into a problem. You have it. Question for that? Okay, let's go to the next type of problem we'll have, and that is this. Those are the procedures. These are for the dollar amounts. These are for finding material misstatements. 
So when it comes up that there's a material misstatement, substantive procedures are the ones that find it. You don't find some uh, material misstatements doing test the controls. Test controls or do they have the, the controls up and working? Uh, no dollar amounts. So um, these substantive tests are the tests that you're actually gonna find the dollar amounts. Okay. Uh, classical sampling is one of the substantive tests and probably the proportion size, which we haven't done yet, is also one. But the same thing holds true for here for the sampling risk for the, uh, for the substantive procedures. You can see that this is very similar to the other one. So, but these are for the dollar amounts. And we have the same problem. Yeah, if we, if, well, first of all, the things that are, if, if our sample is the same as the population as a whole, everything's okay. So if we say they're not materially misstated, they're not, that's fine. If we say they're materially misstated, and they truly are materially misstated, that's fine. If we think that they are materially misstated and they aren't, we're gonna reject it, but usually we'll do additional testing and the additional testing a lot of times will come around to show us that it's, uh, that we should accept it. So, so if we come up with, the, with our sample that is materially misstated when actually the books aren't misstated, they're, you know, they're not materially misstated, um, this will lead us to an inefficient audit, but uh, we'll actually come around to the right answer. This is the dangerous one. The risk of incorrect acceptance is that when you think that everything's okay, they're not materially misstated when they actually are. So this is the one that is the problem. Uh, risk of incorrect acceptance. That's when you think that the, the financial statements are okay, they're not materially misstated, but they actually are. Okay, so there actually is a relationship between test controls and um, some of the testing. And usually the auditors don't determine this. It's usually the results that determine it. Right. So let me, let me stop sharing for a second here. So suppose you have um, your, your testing controls. And the controls are terrible. They're, they're, they're terrible. You know, they, they're, they're not following the controls. They're not designed right, whatever it is. They're, they're not, you know, controls are bad. Are you going to do more testing of controls? You know, yes or no? Are you going to do more testing of controls? You, you, you're, you're testing the controls. You, you know, maybe get halfway through testing the controls. And they're just horrible. Are you going to do more testing of controls? Yes. Probably not. And here's really? why. yeah. And here's why you can't rely on them. You know, if, if the controls are bad, so bad that you can't rely on them, you're going to stop testing the internal controls because you're not going to get any more. Um, it, it's unlikely that you're going to be able to rely on them. So, when you're testing the controls, if you can't rely on them. You know, they're, they're terrible, whatever, you know, however you come up to that conclusion. At that point, you say, okay, I'm not going to test the controls because I can't, re you know, it's not going to save me a lot of time by using them. I'm just going to do more substantive testing. So instead of taking 300 items, I'm going to take 1,000 items for substantive testing. So there's actually an inverse relationship. Let me get back to that.
So there's actually an inverse relationship between these. So suppose the initial testing of the, the, the you know, controls cannot be relied upon. So what you're going to do is stop. <laughs> what are our double orders? So, uh, increase test of control. Uh, oh, uh, okay. So, this is what you're going to do. I didn't really read that, did I? So for, so for example, if you were going to do 300 items, you may say, okay, I'm going to do 1,000 items now because I can't rely on the internal controls, but I still have to get comfortable with the numbers, so I'm going to stop testing the controls. Now, remember, too, though, that I think I talked about this last time. Maybe I did. Um, just because there's a, a problem with internal controls does not necessarily mean that the financial statements are misstated. Uh, you know, they could have a problem with internal controls. You know, they're, they're not, you know, they don't have um, an operations manager signing off on the purchase order. Internal control problem. But just because they, they, they don't have, does not necessarily mean that the financial statements are misstated. It just means that those controls can't be relied upon to you know, to reduce your testing of your substantive testing. So at that point, you just stop and say, okay, I can't, I can't use these internal controls. I can't rely on them. We're going to go to substantive procedures instead. And just do test the dollar amounts. And again, you'd increase it, you know, from 300 to 1,000 or whatever, whatever the numbers are. So test the controls. Have an inverse relationship. You know, if you do more of one, you do less of the other. Now, you do test the controls, and the controls work great. You can rely on them. You bank back off on the substantive test. You know, these controls are really, they're, they're catching everything. You know, uh, okay, well, we don't need to test as much of the, uh, the dollar amounts because the controls are actually working pretty well. So it's an inverse relationship. Any question on that? Okay, let's go ahead and take a break. Um, I'm going to send you guys some multiple choice questions that we'll go over next week. Oh, I figured out how to do the polling. <laughs> and, uh, um, I figured out how to do the polling in the. Uh, so it's um, so we can do that. The multiple choice questions. Anyway, uh, so let's go ahead and take a break. Maybe back in. Uh, yeah, maybe be back at what? Uh, oh, let's go crazy. Let's go back at seven seventeen. <laughs> and and we will start in on chapter three.
I'm sorry, I was talking to you guys and I was muted. And I gotta do something here. When I do a drop down box, it gives me that weird window thing. Okay, uh, so chapter three, planning the audit. Did we, did we start this? I don't think we did. No. No, okay. Okay, so um, client acceptance. If this is one of those things that is kind of unusual and that makes auditing different than a lot of other things. That auditing is not like McDonald's. You know, in McDonald's, you walk in, you pay your money, they hand you the food. You know, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't matter who you are or whatever. In auditing, it's different. That you don't just take every client. You know, you have to be qualified to take the client first of all. That you, you know, you can do the audit and that you're independent and all that kind of stuff. But also the client themselves. Uh, you don't just take every client, and that. And they, they really stress this heavily in, on the CPA exam that the integrity of the client is one of the most important factor. And that you do not associate with clients of ill repute. That um, the only thing that we give to the financial statements, the only thing that external auditors give is credibility. And if you are associating with people that aren't credible, uh, that that hurts that credibility. So that, you know, the AICPA's view of it is you avoid uh, taking clients that are not on the up and up. Also, to some extent, you have to, you have to trust the client. Because if you don't trust the client, if you think about it, if, if, if you didn't trust the client, if you really thought that they were doing something underhanded or fraud or whatever, you'd have to test everything 100%. It'd be a very expensive audit. So, you know, those two things, the risk factor is that you'd have to do a tremendous amount more work if they, you, know, you, you couldn't trust the client. But also, you know, the AICPA's view of it is, look, you're going to basically tarnish the whole, you know, all your audits in, in, in the profession, basically, if you take and put a stamp of approval, you know, the CPA stamp of approval on uh, uh, again, people of ill repute. Um, so you don't just take everybody who wants an audit. So then uh, we had an audit, we had a guy who ran his own CPA firm and he actually did audits, which is a little bit unusual for smaller CPA firms, but he had a few of them. He said, you know, that he had this one guy call up and wanted, I just need this audit report. Just, you know, well, I got to look at your, you know, your, your tax records and all the, like taxes. No, no, I just need to. <laughs> No, I got to see everything else. <laughs> you know, uh, it, it, again, it's not just you know McDonald's where someone walks in and you go, oh, here you go, I'll, sure, I'll do an audit. You know, um, it's not like that. So you have some hoops to jump through. Uh, first thing is your CPA firm is, is is it qualified? You know, are you qualified to do it? Now, even if you're not qualified. If you believe that you can become qualified enough to complete the audit, you can take it. So if you have a strong belief and that, you know, and, and some reason for that belief. And I'm assuming, assuming qualification would be based off of um, auditor's experience and size of the client, or I don't yeah, know. Yeah, so for, uh, well, let, let me, um, for example, if you know, let's say that there's someone who runs, a, there's a large company that runs a, um, a string of coin-operated op uh, laundry mats. Maybe you never did those, and, and and you know, so you're not going to be an expert in those in, in coin-operated laundry mats. 
And quite honestly, if you didn't have any clients that were in there, why would you be an expert in it? You know, you, you only become proficient in those things that you uh, need to for, you know, for your clients. So, um, let's get, you know, Oh, okay. Let's open eye. Uh, so, if you believe you can get the uh, experience you need, and, the, and getting the uh, experience or the uh, background that you need, it could be uh, calling in a um, an expert, you know, getting advice from somebody who's already done it. It could be looking up online and, and using resources from uh, the AICPA and other groups to, you know, to, to determine what you need to do to audit, you know, say this new client. So yeah, it, it it you generally are you know our, our basic background is what we're doing right now. This is getting our education uh, in it. But again, industries are very you know going from one audit to another can be very um, maybe very different. And I'll, let me finish the sentence, and then I'll um I'll, I'll, I'll talk about something that happened actually uh, in one of the companies I worked at. Okay, so if they believe they can successfully complete the mm -hmm. audit, uh, they may take the audit even if they're in unfamiliar territory. So I don't know anything about coin operated uh, laundry mats. I know that, you know, that I'm sure they have people that do routes and then collect the coins out of the machines and do, all, you know, there's all kinds of controls and stuff there. And I have to get familiar with that. But if you believe you can complete the audit, you can take it and then do the necessary. Uh, things to become proficient with it, but um, yeah, you don't. But again, you don't have to have that knowledge going in. And if you think about it, you know that unless you had a client that fell into that category, it, it, it'd be kind of silly to become proficient in that if you don't have any clients doing it that are in that area. So you can take it as long as you believe that you can successfully complete the audit. Now, if you don't think you can successfully complete the audit, then you can't take it. And, and that goes true, and that's true of, of um, whether it's because you're qualified or because if we're talking with a client, you don't think that they have enough, uh, enough documentation and so forth to complete it. If you have somebody that works in cash all the time, you know, all they, all they work at is cash. It's, it's real difficult. There's no audit trail. There's no, you know, you don't know who they're paying cash to, where they're giving cash from and all that kind of stuff. So it is possible too that you can't complete the audit and then you you, you should not take it. But the the um, the one that I, that I was uh, somewhat involved in is the, when I worked for Navistar, Navistar sells trucks. And there's a requirement that if you buy a truck, you must have insurance. And what was happening is that we were having, um, we were losing sales basically for trucks because some of the people couldn't get insurance. Sometimes it was, you know, it was obvious why they couldn't get insurance, but sometimes it was the, insur the insurance companies, they had no background and other words, you know, whatever it was that they couldn't get insurance. So it made sense for us to buy an insurance company. We did. We bought a trucking insurance company. Insurance companies are really weird. <laughs> they have a, a ton of assets on one side, and then they have a ton of liabilities on the other side. You know, and they're you basically have those those ton of assets for when you have to pay the claims out for the you know, and so. And, and there's all, there's all kinds of regulation in it and, and, and so forth. So anyway, so we have this this insurance company that we bought, and so here's Navistar. We build trucks, the big you know, big noisy plants that put together you know assembly lines coming down, people putting big tires on, people lining up transmissions, people doing all this stuff. And then you have an insurance company where Everybody wears a suit. And 
I, I'm not sure where it came from, but, but somewhere high up in the company when they were deciding on this, they said, okay, we have to use the same auditors we use for the manufacturing part of the company as we do for the insurance part. So we had a bunch of people who were used to doing manufacturing company audits. They were now doing the insurance company audit. You know, it was a separate audit. Uh, and you had to do it separately because there's regulations and stuff on the insurance companies. It wasn't surprising that the insurance audit was a complete disaster. That it was, you know, now I came in, um, it was, it was the third year. And they'd actually, <laughs> someone high up finally reversed the decision and said, okay, we'll have insurance auditors audit the insurance company. And our regular auditors will keep auditing our you know, regular operations, and, and that worked out way better. But the work papers they had from the work we the time before, I actually worked on the audit. And I think it was the third year. Um, it was it was kind of crazy. I mean, it, 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 for instance, they would have they had two reports that came out of the same system, and a big part of the audit was comparing these two reports. And it had nothing to do with the sources <laughs> of where it came from. They were comparing one end report with another end report and there was all this documentation on it and it was, it was kind of silly i mean it, it, because it didn't it didn't prove anything um, but again that was because we insisted that we have to use the same auditors even though they had no expertise in doing insurance companies and so you, you can't run into those situations that was a that was a situation where the auditors probably should have put their foot down and say said no we can't do this um you know, as an insurance company, we've never done insurance companies. We're used to doing cost of goods sold and manufacturing costs and, you know, all that kind of stuff rather than this financial stuff that has to do with actuaries and everything else. So because of that, it was uh, split up. But that was a, a situation in which um, the, the, the company kind of forced the, the, uh, the auditors to do something they shouldn't have, um, you know. All right. Uh, oh, and, and by the way, that was the audit that I found. I think I told you guys this. I found a $100,000 error in cash, and I was all excited about it. And I took it to the audit. Look, look, look $100,000 error. And the guy looked at me like I was nuts. So, <laughs> well, it's, it's off by $100,000. So, you know, because you're talking about millions and millions, it doesn't make any, it's not material. Okay. Uh, legal requirements, legal ethical requirements. First of all, you must be independent. And we talked about this, I think, that he has to be uh, independent and, and um, doing blanks tonight. Uh, in, in fact, and appearance. So you have to be independent. Uh, no one owns stock in the company. No one has uh, relatives in key positions and that sort of thing. So the ethical requirements, and by the way, this might seem kind of uh, on a lower level or trivial, but this is actually a big chunk of the CPA exam for auditing is based on this. Uh, you may have other clients you know, you may have other competitors of the potential new client uh, that it might cause a conflict. You know, if you have a, you know, just an example of if, you have, if you're auditing Ford and you're also auditing uh, Chrysler or something, whatever it is, um, that might be a problem because they're, they're very much competitors. They have um, ways of doing business and so forth and they may be afraid that something's gonna leak or whatever it is. Uh, lawsuits. You may be working, you may have one client, you know, let's say you're working for Ford and Ford sued Chrysler and Chrysler wants an audit from you. And, you know, uh, I think it's, I don't know, does Downer still own Chrysler? I'm not sure who owns Chrysler anymore. But anyway, the idea is exactly the same. But you may have a 
lawsuits and so forth between clients, and that can put you in a compromised position. Okay, so there's or you, or you may even have lawsuits with a client. I, I know that there's been times that CPA firms have been sued or sued companies, and then had those same companies want to use them as auditors. So you have lawsuits, and you are you know being asked to be an auditor. So you do have to, you know, these are actually, well, they may seem kind of uh, like, well, duh. Um, they're also uh, very important and they, they test them pretty heavily. You know, which of these situations would cause the auditor's independence to be impaired? You know, a bunch of, you, you, you find questions like that, a lot of them on that. So client acceptance is actually a little more um, involved than, uh, than, than, than simply just taking anybody, even if it does seem like they're, you know, they're on the up and up and all that kind of stuff. All right, this is the huge one. I know I marked that one red, but this one is gonna be marked, um, I don't know. Super turquoise. The AICPA will come back again and again saying that this is the most important thing when it comes to selecting a client is that you, their integrity and their reputation. Can you trust them? And if you can't, you shouldn't take them. Okay. If there is a Predecessor auditor, I should probably talk about this. I should talk about this. Let, 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 me, let me, so we contact the predecessor auditor. Terminology. Okay, the successor auditor. This is the new auditor. If you're so, if you're contemplating getting this client, that's what you are. You're the new auditor. The predecessor auditor is the previous auditor, the old auditor. So when it says contact the predecessor auditor, this means that the successor auditor is required to contact the predecessor. And what do I think? So the successor auditor is required to contact the predecessor auditor if one exists. So if they had a previous auditor, you are required to contact them. It does not go the other way around. The predecessor has no obligation to contact the new auditor, the successor auditor. The successor auditor is under the obligation. They're required to do it before they take the client. So before they take the client, they're required to contact the predecessor auditor. Um, so you have to get uh, approval from the client to do this.
So the client must approve you contacting the VA. Remember, this is still confidential information. So you contact the predecessor and say, okay, well, I got to get you know, approval from the client to disclose any information. All right, so the, the client will have to approve it and then you contact the successor or the, pre, the predecessor. Excuse me. All right, so now suppose the client doesn't do that. So the, the client said, look, you know, those guys are a bunch of jerks. I don't want you talking to them. And, you know, if you have to do extra work because you're not talking to them, that's fine. I'll pay for it. Uh, I don't want you talking to those guys. They're, they're idiots. Can't stand them. Can you take the audit? So the client refuses to let you talk to the predecessor auditor. Can you take the? Can you take them as a, as a client? Are you guys sleeping? You're sleeping, aren't you? We'll turn your mics on. We hear you snoring. We're up. Huh? You're up. Okay. Uh, so can they take him? So the, the, you go to the, the client says, I don't want you talking to the other auditors. I'm not going to get, approve it. Um, you know, do whatever you need to do for the audit, but I don't want you talking to them. Can you take them as a client? No. No. It, you know, and, and you have to, uh, they, they, if they don't give approval, what they call a scope limitation. Yeah, I spell limitation right. Uh, so this is what they call a scope limitation. And a scope limitation is when the client doesn't allow you the information that you need to do the audit. And that is a very serious thing, a scope limitation. And, and it also leads you to want to, you know, now you really want to talk to the, to the predecessor auditor when someone says that they're not going to give you the approval. Um, it, it's sort of like, you know, the murder investigation, they come to my house, I think I told you this before, but you know, and they say, we search your house uh, for the murder. Yeah, you can search the whole house, but don't look in this closet. You know, well, first place you want to look is in the closet. It's the same thing. You know, don't look in this closet. Don't don't talk to my press Roger, but you know, you know, you know, you know, you know but don't, don't don't talk to them. You know, so whenever they you have a client that has a scope, which is a scope limitation, uh, if it's material, if it's uh, you know, and this certainly would be. Um, you can't take them as a client. You just tell them, look, most of you talk, you know, maybe they are jerks. They could be very, you know, they could be I don't know, but you still have to be able to talk to them. And you know, that's what you basically tell the client. Imagine you would look, you, know, you might be right, but I still got to talk to them. So if they don't allow for it, um, it's a scope limitation and you generally cannot take it. There are unusual situations where you cannot talk to the predecessor auditor. Why, don't you, why can't I talk to the predecessor auditor? Because the predecessor auditor died. You know, they're not around anymore. You know, they left the country or whatever. Um, so there could be reasons why you can't talk to the predecessor auditor, but usually it's only for those things that are out of control of the client. You know. The client says, well, that's the reason why you have new auditors is because the old auditor passed away. So <laughs> I, I allow you to talk to them, but you know, they're not, they're not around. So so anyway, okay. Now, if it's an issuer, now there's a publicly traded. They 
must file an 8K report when they change auditors. Uh, the 8K report is not only for auditors. 8K report is for any change in the company. So a company gets a new president, an 8K report is filed with the SEC. They get a new chief financial officer, 8K report is filed with the SEC. Uh, they purchase a, um, a competitor, an 8K report is filed with the SEC. So anytime there's a, there's a change in the company, there's a, you know, I can say, uh, you know, somewhat of material change, I don't think they use that terminology, but anytime there's a, a, a material change in the company, uh, an 8K report is filed. Now, one of those reasons for filing an 8K is ooh, an auditor change. So if they change auditors, they file an 8K report. Uh, the 8K report, somebody says, we changed auditors from this auditor to whatever the next auditor is. So the 8K report is, is there. It must be filed with the SEC. It is, they're supposed to put in the 8K report, and they actually will. I'll tell you why in a second. The AK report will have Any significant disagreements with the predecessor auditors over the last few years? So they'll have to list all the, the uh, significant disagreements they had with the old auditors over the last few years. And the way it works out is they file the 8K. The SEC sends the 8K report to the predecessor auditor and says, is this everything? And it's either a yes or no answer. You don't explain anything. Is this everything? Yes or no. If you say no, the SEC will take it back to the company and say, you've got to include more in here because the auditors are not agreeing with it. But all the disagreements for the last three years, yeah, and you, know, you keep going that circle until the auditors say, yeah, that's everything. So it's a yes or no. Um, the, the, auditors will, the previous auditors will approve it yes or no. Okay, so. Talking to the successor auditor, the big thing is you're looking for is this. Good. Integrity of management. You know, are they, can you trust these people? Are they trustworthy and that sort of thing? Uh, and the SEC will tell you that's the most important thing. They really hammer that. Integrity of management. Uh, reasons for the change or the reasons why the the, what the auditors believe that the reason for the change was. The reason for the change will not be in the 8K report. The company does not have to explain their decisions to the SEC. They're just telling them, and, and that's for anything in the 8K, basically. Auditors do not have to explain, or the, uh, if, you're, if you're a company, you're an issuer, and you do a change, you do not have to explain it to the SEC. You don't have to explain to the SEC why we, um, you know, got rid of the old chief financial officer and we got a new one in. You, you don't have to explain, you just have to tell them we changed it, you know, we changed it or whatever. So this, in this case, changing auditors, they don't have a good reason, but you will want to talk to the, the predecessor auditor and say, uh, is, you know, um, why, why do you think that they went for the change? It could be a number of reasons. It could, be, it could be the auditor didn't want to do the audit. It could be, you know, whatever, whatever it is. Uh, disagreements with management. And this is, this can be beyond this up here, the last few years. This would be disagreements with management going back, you know, 10 years or whatever. So they're not limited to what they can tell you about the disagreements with management. 
or something happened five years ago, it won't show up in the 8K report, but they can tell you about it. Uh, communication with the audit committee, uh, related party unusual transactions. And this kind of goes into integrity of management. Um, related party transactions are people that are uh, either within the company, and it could also be people who are major shareholders and stuff outside the company and transactions between them. Uh, beyond the predecessor auditor, uh, third parties, bankers, uh, bankers, lawyers, customers, vendor, et cetera. You also do background searches. There actually are places that will do background searches, and these can be quite extensive. Uh, I actually saw one of these, and they're um, almost voyeuristic in how they, they uh, it's probably even worse now. You know? I saw one in the early 90s. Um, they, get, they get quite a bit of information on those. Okay, um, client continuation and Uh, client continuation is basically the same things you go through here and that you want to keep them as a client. So client continuation is, you know, after you do the audit, going into the next year, every year you should determine whether you want to continue with this client or not. And, and sometimes, you know, I, I, I knew a, a friend of mine was doing, it was a CPA firm and they had decided not to continue with, um, there was actually not of a bank. And, and the problem was, was with the, the, the president. The president was just a complete squirrel. And, uh, it was a family, a family run bank and, 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 and they, you know, they asked the question, did they have any, do any relatives work in the bank? And the guy said, no. And as they're going through an employee list, you know, half the employees have the same last name. And so then they had to say, you know, they actually sat down in the president and said, is this person related to you? Yes. Uh, that's my daughter. Is this person related to you? Yes, that's my niece. Is this person related to you? Yes, that's my brother. That's my, you know, and they literally came, they came up with 30 or 40 people that were related. But, you know, it, it was like that constantly. That the, the guy was not truthful. <laughs> and so going into the next year, it wasn't a very big audit, but it actually said, look, we're, we're not going to deal with this. It was, you know, it was ridiculous. It lies to us and, you know, we have to go looking um, all over for information. Okay. Uh, one thing I'm going to talk about, though, is clients that have never had an audit. I should have put the, it's not in the book, I don't think, but I'm going to put it in here. This will be the last one. So clients that have never had a month. Okay. Uh, this can be a problem. And I think I'll show you, I'm gonna do, do it in Excel. Okay, so let's say we have this situation. Okay, so suppose we have this. We have sales of, I'm just making up numbers. We have sales of 5,000. And this is the income statement.
Uh, they're beginning inventory of, say, purchases of So the total available was what, 5,200? Yeah. Okay, the ending inventory. So this is almost made available. Uh, ending inventory, they saw, uh, the ending inventory was, um, let's say 1,400. So the cost could, I don't want to put that over there. So the cost of goods sold was that one. Uh, Thirty-eight hundred. So then we have a gross margin, a gross profit of twelve hundred. Okay. So here's the income statement. What number on that income statement would be really hard to figure out at year end? So you come in and do an audit, first year audit. They didn't have an audit last year. Which number on there are you basically not gonna be able to verify? Begin an inventory. Yep. You can't jump in the time machine, go back and do an inventory audit. So if they didn't have, now if they had a if they had an audit last year, you can you take the ending inventory and that'll become the beginning. But if they have never had an audit, um, that's gonna be a problem. If if it if it's material. You know, if, it, if it's a material part of their business. And in this case, it would be because it looks like their sales are all based on cost of sold. I mean, if it was like, you know, a small incidental amount, you wouldn't worry about it. But if it's, uh, you know, a significant part of their business, then um, you do. So this would be a problem. Now, if they have time, you know, if it isn't, we need an audit this year, um, you can. You can just audit the inventory and then you do a complete audit for the next year. So you do an agreed upon procedure. You just audit the inventory next year. That agreed upon procedure of just the inventory amount, you can use that in your audit as a verification of the beginning inventory. If they have to do it immediately, though, there's, there can be a problem. And um, it's possible that you have this situation in the first year inventory and that is that you can have different opinions on different so it's possible that you get a disclaimer on these two where you say we can't find enough information but then on the balance sheet Uh, you get a clean opinion. So it is possible that you get different opinions and different financial statements. And you say, well, why would you do that? Well, because if you can give a clean opinion on the balance sheet, at least that's giving them something. So if they have to get an audit, you know, at least they can go to the bank and say, look, you know, they didn't give us a, any opinion on those two income statements. Statement of cash flows come out, it comes out of the income statement. So if you can't verify this, you can't verify that. Um, but you can say, that, look, at least at the end of the year, all the stuff on the balance sheet is okay. You know, um, so that's why you're kind of doing it. Uh, it. It will help them in that way. But first year, because the inventory is the problem, um, a lot of times they you, you have to tell the client, look, we can't give you a clean opinion on the income statement, statement of cash flows in the first year. 
because we can't not, we can't verify that be any inventory. We can give you a clean feed on the balance sheet, but not on the, you know, the income statement. Okay, so let me stop sharing and reshare. Nope, nope, not there. Okay. Um, they may get. Oops. They may get uh, not underlined or bold. You may get a standard opinion on the income statement because the um, beginning of inventory cannot be verified. And the balance sheet, you, you, you can get uh, a clean opinion, but you can't get it on the income statement because of the beginning of inventory. And again, you don't have that problem if you have a predecessor auditor because you can use their audit report to verify that the ending inventory, which becomes the beginning inventory, is. Uh, uh, let's stop there. Okay. Um, save this. So here's what I'm going to do. I now some of you. I, I think that the um, the exam is it due tonight or tomorrow? I can't remember. To be honest with you. Uh, I think I think I, I do tonight. It's either tonight or tomorrow. Anyway, so I get that in if you haven't already. And, uh, and we'll talk about it next week. Uh, I'm going to send out multiple choice questions related to the um, statistics, 10 of them. If you can do those, and I think at the beginning of class next week, we'll, just, we'll go through them. And, and you'll be able to actually have the poll up. Uh, actually have a poll that you can actually um, we'll, we'll be able to fill in. That, and from now on, we can, we'll be able to use it. So anyway, um, uh, so I'll send it out to you. I'll probably get it out within the next hour or so. Yeah, so in the next hour, I'll send it out. And, and, and that way you guys can look over it and uh, see if you can figure them out. I think there's 10, 10 questions on it. And then they mostly are related to that sampling overview that we just did. So I will send that out momentarily well in the next hour, I see. Um, any questions? <laughs> All right. Well, uh, in that case, I will sign off and I will uh, talk to you guys next week and I'll send out that, those multiple choice questions. And again, uh, see if you can get in all the stuff. And, and, and by the way, I, think I, told you, I don't know if I told you guys this before, but I... Uh, I don't take off points for turning in stuff late, but it won't it won't be in your grade until you do. So I would strongly encourage you to get the stuff in and to kind of keep up with the class. So um, make sure you get uh, the stuff in. You can take pictures of your work. You do not, and it could be your notebook. You know, if you if you wrote it in a notebook, you take a picture of it. You can unload unlimited pictures into your Blackboard. There's no problem with doing that. About half my students do. It. So. Uh, you don't have to rewrite it. You don't have to retype it. Nothing. Just take pictures of whatever you have, and uh, and, and submit it that way. So um, yeah. And any questions on any of that? And and and, and by the way, uh, if you submit the individual pictures, it's usually better than if you put them in a zip file or you know try bunching them together, because sometimes it doesn't. I can't open those. Well, I, I can open them, but I have to jump through some hoops. But if you just put the pictures in, there's no, there, you don't need to do that. I'll put it this way. You can just drop all the pictures in and it's unlimited, the number of files you can put in those. So um, and I don't think I was clear about that earlier. So anyway, it's unlimited the amount of pictures of files you can put in. So if you put in 10 pictures, that's fine. Any questions? Okay.
Okay. Well, I will talk to you guys next week and I will send out the um, multiple choice questions for the sampling overview. Yeah, it should be in the next hour. Okay, okay good night. Good night, guys. Good night. Good night.